Welcome back, everybody. We're going to get right into it with this one. Dan and I chatted about things we ate on the road, put in our bodies, and some tidbits about living in a van. So, guys, without further ado, enjoy the show. All right, Dave, question for you. Mm. Where is the sketchiest spot you've ever had to eat a meal? Ooh. That's tough. Uh, I got to think back in the database a little bit. I can tell you, okay, uh, no, this is a good one. So when I was in Forsaken, we were playing a show at the Backstage Pass in Woodmere in Brooklyn, New York. And a great venue. It's attached to a bowling alley. So they had vending machines in the bowling alley. And while we were waiting to play, we were like, all right, we can't afford the cafeteria that they got. Even the glizzies were too expensive. So we were <laughs> like, let's hit the let's hit the vending machine. And for some reason, no shade on backstage pass. We only got drink tickets, no food. Uh, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but we went into this bowling alley. We played like two games of bowling. And my drummer at the time was like, oh, dude, I'm starving. And we went to this vending machine that was at one side of the bowling alley, and it was called the Kosher Cafe. That's what it was called. Okay. And it was not some ordinary vending machine. This was, they had mozzarella sticks. They had nachos. They had, like, stuff like that. But it was through a vending machine. So it was All already right. sketchy. So we got mozzarella sticks. We got <laughs> a couple things of mozzarella sticks. And we got them out, and it, like, made all this noise. And then was, like, bang! And then dropped the mozzarella sticks in like a regular, you know, like little container. But All right. They were, they were fucking like brick frozen. Oh we no. Oh we no. Like, Are we going to die? Like this is, <laughs> this is horrible. My drummer definitely ate them. He was all about it. They were disgusting, <laughs> but that was definitely one of the things where I was like, all right, well I can sit here with a couple beers in me and not eat mozzarella sticks and chance it. Or I could just sit here a couple beers in me and wait till I play and be, you know, feeling like crap. So that's, that's one of the sketchiest. There's definitely more. I'll have to think about it, man. Honestly, like I haven't had too many completely sketchy food experiences, but I will say there's been those couple times where it's like, you're just driving through the middle of the country. You're starving, but there's nothing around, especially when you're driving through like Texas and New Mexico going out that way. There isn't a whole lot of shit around. So sometimes you're forced to have just like kind of like Dave was talking about vending machine food. Sometimes you have to go into these like really sketchy little Texas gas stations that have prepackaged deli food and you hope to God you don't get food poisoning after you eat one. But sometimes you just got to fucking eat. Texas, why are you so sketchy? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my favorite venue I ever played was in Texas. Uh, oh, man, what's it called? Uh, Tomcats West. Really awesome venue in uh, Fort Worth. Oh, Dallas area is pretty cool. So is yeah, Austin. For sure. What do they have at this establishment to eat? Uh, you know, pretty much your usual suspects, like prepackaged tuna fish sandwich. Uh, a real, real sketchy, like, just, which is what I got. I chanced it. It was like a prepackaged chicken sandwich that you can just throw in a microwave in the gas station and eat. Yeah, super, super sketch. I did not die, thankfully. Had that in a bag of chips. It's still here. Still here. Some of the sketchiest things have been at weird convenience stores. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Friends, if you haven't noticed, uh, the theme of this episode is food on the road. We are going to be talking about some of the weirdest things and some of the best things that we possibly could have had while living on the road and how to be resourceful with uh, the bleak cash that you're getting. <laughs> Sometimes not at all. <laughs> Sometimes not at all. Yeah. Sometimes that tuna salad sandwich at 7-Eleven and that bomb burrito look like a Thanksgiving feast. You know that hot dog that's been on that rotating little gurney there probably like four fucking hours just roasting. Yeah, sometimes that looks good. 
<laughs> I will say, though, middle America, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, all those places, you guys have subways and gas stations, and that is a lifesaver, especially 10, 15 years ago when the $5 foot long or the $3 six inch was the jam to get. I could get a foot long for five bucks, and that would feed me for the entire day. But there's also something to be said about Subway now versus Subway like 15, 20 years ago. It used to be a, a little bit better. It's probably always been horrible for us. <laughs> Which is a weird concept considering we're both from New England and there's just so many amazing fucking local delis. But, you know, shitty palate. Subway it is. <laughs> True, you could be in somewhere else in the country and you'd be like, Oh dude, I want a hoagie. And people are like, what the fuck is a hoagie? Oh, depending on where you're from, they'll just look at you all weird. Oh, you got any uh, meatball grinders here? They'll look at you like you're a fucking madman. <laughs> What's a grinder. A lot of people don't, don't get the grinder thing. Uh, Definitely not thing. that, that that's it. That's like exclusive up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People will be like, well, subway, you calling it a grinder. Well, it's a submarine sandwich. Well, I've never heard of that. Well, you uncultured swine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I probably lived off of like Burger King and McDonald's for years. Oh, dude, don't even get me started. <clears throat> the first Arc Tours was like Taco Bell. God damn. So much Taco Bell. <laughs> I, I to this day, like I had so much of it from the time that I was in Ark of the Covenant that I I can only go there every so often. And especially around here where I live, there aren't that many good ones. So you really have to go around lunchtime to get any decent service. Anything after like three o'clock, you're fucked. I don't want to shit on Taco Bell, but no, because I love the pandemic. Ta I love good. I love good Taco Bell. Yeah. Since the pandemic, Taco Bells are never open. <laughs> They're they're always closed in my area. And oh, that's weird. Around here, they're still open till like two here. You'll go there at lunchtime, and there'll be a trash can in the drive-through lane, and they're like, "We're closed." Probably that's just lack of people wanting to work at those places anymore. Probably, and that says something for Taco Bell, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but, yeah, no, we're not going to go down that road, but yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about that, but not here. <laughs> well, Taco Bell used to be able to. Depending on the location, you used to be able to get, you know, Taco Bell with a, a KFC or Taco Bell with a Long John Silvers. Oh, and there's so many. Or the the infamous uh, Kentucky Taco Hut Buffet. Oh, whoa, whoa. Hold yeah. up. Yeah. That's news to my ears. Where is that <laughs> located? I'm ready for a vacation. I don't remember, but I remember once. Like I've been to I've been to a Kentucky Taco Hut. I've I, I've seen that with the Pizza Hut Express with KFC and Taco Bell. But then there was one time, I don't think we actually went, but we passed a sign that advertised like the Kentucky Taco Hut, but it had the KFC buffet as well. I was just like, what? How do they do that? I bet you KFC doesn't even do buffets anymore. I'm uh, sure. They're they're honestly they were in the south. The the only places where you still find them. I'm going to be weird about this, but in the south, especially once you get past North Carolina. Yeah. Boiled peanuts. Not for me. Oh, OK. Love them. Love them. I've still yet to I'm still weirded out by the fact that there's people out there that put peanuts in Coca-Cola and that's like a thing. That is a thing, and it's never tried it. Not strange. knocking it. It. I'm just acknowledging its existence, and it just looks kind of funny. I don't really drink soda. I did uh, when I was on the fair. road though, because I needed calories. So you gotta, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pump stuff up. Uh, one of the biggest things that you could find for me that was a highlight was like a Dunkin' Donuts coming from new england you were like oh well, there's a dunk oh here. yeah I'm once you go get away once you get away from like the east coast it's just like non-existent yep there's a couple in california uh there's yeah no there's a couple couple on the west coast but still like not nearly as much as <laughs> like i'm pretty sure like new england is just like the hub for all dunkin donuts it's duncan now i guess but or you know. whatever duncan rebranded yeah. same shit whatever it is the point being, when you're on the road, 
unless you're making money, you're not really eating well. And you're eating what you can. Now, it's very gracious when a venue feeds you or gives you enough money to eat and pay for gas. And you make a little bit of money on merch. Uh, but it's also even better when a fan had contacted you on MySpace or Facebook or whatever it is. Is like, go oh, crash at my house. We'll buy a bunch of pizzas or something like that. That's the best situation. I have like a great story about that. So I will say probably some of my best memories for uh, touring with Ark. Our first tour was only like three weeks long. And just to let you know, especially bands nowadays starting during or post pandemic anywhere around there, you know, like it used to be it. Uh, people were a lot more trusting than they are now. Uh, I would say, cause we did a three week run. And we didn't have to sleep in our van or a parking lot the entire run because we had uh, like a floor or a place to actually crash in or something to the, the, that effect. It, and I'm sure Dave can attest that is very rare when you're a DIY band. It's I never realized how sketchy that really was just showing up. Somebody's you are letting just... a bunch of strangers you have never met until you just saw them at this gig and you're just like. Yeah, come crash at my place. Now, it helps when sometimes the the promoter because they you know they get it, but still, it's still a real trusting thing and a really kind thing to do to trust a bunch of strangers to come into your home and not destroy your place. You know, I've heard horror stories from guys that we've stayed with that had bands stay over and they were absolutely horrible house guests, and I could never understand that. Oh, dudes can be reckless. Absolutely. And I know it's worse when you have like alcohol or drugs involved. That's a, another thing to be said. Just normal dudes just being dicks just for the sake of doing so because they have no like, I don't know, moral compass or idea of like how you're supposed to treat other stuff. It's really odd. All the times that I spent in a stranger's house sleeping on their couch or a recliner or the floor or an extra bedroom with three other people in the same bed just to get a decent night's sleep. Fortunately for us, the van we had, even though there was a gas leak, like we mentioned before, in one of the vans, <laughs> um, we were able to sleep, you know, when they, when the van was off and we vented it, it was, it was good. But in the winter, it didn't work so well. Cause you had to try to figure out some ways to eat and then not freeze to death. Especially if you were in a Northern state that has real winter. So, being in somebody's house, I never thought about it. I always treated it like if you're going over like a girlfriend's house, you know, like I'm never, you never know what to do when you're at somebody's house. You're like, oh, well, if I use the bathroom, I got to make sure that I clean everything when I'm done out of here. And I got to make sure that the towel's perfect, at least from my perspective. I never wanted, especially if they allowed us to use their showers, you know, and use their towels and you know, their products, if we didn't have it, especially being so broke at times, you, you forget that you're living in someone else's dwelling and to play devil's advocate, who knows if that person just gained five kidneys, you know, <laughs> I mean, fair assessment. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's been a couple of people we've crashed with that are lived in more than questionable situations. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I've stayed in some rough living situations, but I was still always thankful to have a place to sleep because sometimes you just don't. And people, you know, it's a humbling experience. I'll say that much. But yeah, cause you can have, you can have some weird experiences while you're in a van, especially in a van, a bus probably. I mean, I'm sure you still deal with it. I've never bus toured, but Van I'm touring. sure like having fever and stuff like that, but that's a whole other thing. Van touring is strange because because you're not allowed to park in certain places. You're allowed to park in a Walmart. You might be able to get get away with another type of parking lot, maybe targets. I don't know. We didn't really stay in targets. Uh, truck stops. You're definitely allowed to. But truck stops are treacherous at sometimes and. And then sleeping outside the venue 
it can be really sketchy. I'm sure some people have had different experiences than what I've had, but I've had some crazy experiences where we wake up in the middle of the night and somebody's trying to break into your van, you know, fiddling with the locks on your trailer. Mm. And there's seven of you in there. And you're like, what the fuck do we do? <laughs> you know, we're we're somewhere else. We're not home. And even if we were home, it's still a scary experience. Yeah, I remember we played a show in uh, Fullerton and uh, we did a uh, we played this gig that uh, Face Down actually came out. It was before we were actually signed to the label and they uh, they ended up uh, coming to check us out. And uh, after the gig, they were basically like, yeah, you can like park where the venue is here if you guys need to crash. But like you have to park over in this like alleyway part. And we're like, oh, OK. So it was like I remember at one point we were all good and like crashed and everything. And then all of a sudden you just hear some scurrying around and you're just like, what was that? You don't know if it's an animal or some homeless crackhead. You have no idea. But thankfully, it didn't turn into anything. We were able to go back to sleep. But. Yeah, it's definitely a interesting lifestyle. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of conflicting things. When it's bad, it's bad. But when it's great, the highs are amazing. Yeah, sing-alongs in a van while you're sitting there for 400 miles is, is pretty yeah. fun. When you have nothing to worry about and you're on your way somewhere else, you played a good show the day before, and you're like, I, we actually have a show that's not going to get canceled or, you know, we have a promoter that's actually going to give us 50 bucks or, you know, some type of, (laughs) some type of compensation. The the craziest thing is when you have a, a venue or a promotion company be like, what do you want for your rider? And we all look at each other and we're like, what the fuck do you mean? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, like the riders were awesome, especially in the case, like for a while, like when we had our more organized tours and we were playing, not necessarily even bigger venues or anything, but you just had like a better contract with whatever, whoever was booking it, you know? But yeah, no, it was nice when there was actually like, you know, food options. That was a rarity on tour where it was just like, Oh, we were playing this venue. These are your options. We're like, Oh shit. (laughs) You know, cool. But most of the time, and if you were really lucky, regardless if the food sucked at the place, uh, any place that offered, uh, you know, buyout, take it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're in the Southwest, loves. Best yeah. truck stop. Yeah. Best truck stop. They always have real food there. You can yep. get like fried chicken in certain spots. I believe there's a Loves in Yuma where you can get buffalo fried chicken, potato wedges, mashed potatoes, mm-hmm. coleslaw, collard greens. You can get all of it out there. And I'm sure that there's more. Uh, Just to pose a question, you've had sheets before, right? I have not. Really? Okay. So, have you had Wawa? Oh yes. Okay. Wawa so was you, a lifesaver in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah. So, so check this out. So you know Wawa, you go up to the screen, you put your order in, all that fun stuff, right? So sheets that they're mainly in like Virginia, uh, a lot of Pennsylvania, um, and I think that's most of it. Maybe it goes into West Virginia, Maryland. I'm not really sure, but definitely uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania. And what I like about sheets is that they actually do. I know it's not as healthy food, but they do like, you know, you can get like fried chicken and and all sorts of stuff, but it's a Wawa style where you just order at the screen and they just bring it out to you. It's kind of fantastic. Wawa had good sandwiches. Anytime we were in Pennsylvania, Wawa was the place to go. Now, since we're back on the food subject, and we talked about this uh, personally the other night. Now, for anybody who's never had West Coast Mexican food or know what a California burrito is or has never experienced one, if you ever get out there, just find any local spot and, my God, treat yourself to that. You can't beat guacamole and french fries in a fucking burrito true facts big facts <laughs> uh, i am a little biased because i do live in southern southern california and the california burrito is something that was created in san diego and la love you but you guys don't do it right uh you add beans and other weird shit blasphemy and- 
Yeah, blasphemy for San Diego. Like, listen, listen. I even like. Uh, I even like. I think. What is it? Is it the Texas? Is the one with chicken, but without guac? That's good too. But yeah, no, I would never want beans on that. That would like completely ruin the texture. That's the point of the the guac. <laughs> Unfortunately, burritos are not as economical as they used to be. <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, not. They're like fifteen bucks now for some places for a california or carne asada burrito um if you want surf and turf living like royalty you're Mm. you're paying an arm and a leg realistically you mentioned taco bell you can go to taco bell get a family meal for 20 bucks have two people buy family meals that's two t-shirts you know you sell two t-shirts you're eating like kings especially with 40 dollars worth of family meals at taco bell uh the problem with Taco Bell when you're living in a van is you don't have any place to shit. So <laughs> that's a big problem. Horror stories of having to stop on the side of the road because one of the guys, and I'm not a very big guy, but some of the guys in my pan were pretty large men. And uh, they they had to go when they had to go. I mean, when you got to go, you got to go. Yeah. And it could be in a real fucked up area. You might have to act like a homeless person sometimes because you might be in a city. And uh, a lot of places in cities don't allow you to use public restrooms unless you spend money. And if we're talking about not being able to spend money, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. I, I think one of the sketchiest gas stations I ever stopped in was probably in like Gary, Indiana. Sounds par. Yeah, dude, it was like three in the morning or something. None, there was like one light at the gas station, and then there was just like two broken cars just chilling next to some pumps. And I'm just like, what is happening? But we needed gas so bad, and there was nothing else around. I think one of the scariest gas stations I've ever been to was in like Trenton, New Jersey. That that tracks. Yeah. St. Louis is pretty rough, too. Depending but, on which part you're in, yeah. Yeah, East St. Louis has got some spots. Oh, man. Uh, all sorts of wild stuff. There was this spot we would always go to when we'd stop in, like, the, like I was telling you, Dave, the other night, uh, Filiberto's. They're a chain, but, like, anytime I was in Mesa, uh, Phoenix area, we'd, uh, we'd stay with our buddy Cody, and we would just walk over there because it was walking distance from his apartment. It was so awesome. Uh, there was one time I ate two California burritos. Now, if you don't know the context of how huge of a burrito that is, ugh, size like, of your forearm. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I forearm. don't regret it. Also, was a hundred percent sober, so that's just I'm a madman, or at least I was. <laughs> one of the toughest things about living in a van, not only the food aspect of like. You're not eating three square meals a day uh, unless you're making money. Absolutely not. You're conserving. You're eating a lot of chips, Slim Jims, uh, taquitos from 7-Eleven. Like I said, pizza. <laughs> but Little Caesars actually helped a lot in certain areas. Um, but one of the biggest things about living in a van is comfortability. And if you're living in a 15 passenger van, now that term is skewed because – It's a 15 passenger van when everybody's sitting straight on benches and not sleeping. Now, mind you, I'm shorter and some of my ex guitar players and members of my bands are, you know, six, four plus. Yeah. So living in a van where your knees are sticking straight up in the air. uh, And it became more economical to take two of the benches out of the four out. That's and, what we did. And just sleep on the floor. Yep. Yeah. We had a uh, futon mattress down. Oh, we didn't even do that. We just fucking slept on the floor. Damn, dude. You guys didn't plan out well at all. <laughs> there was planning. That was the thing. There was planning. It was just. <laughs> you live, you learn. One person called the back bunk. Another person called the other bunk. And they were the two biggest dudes in the band. And the two lighter guys had to sit in the or the three lighter guys had to sleep you know there was enough room it was like a king size bed but there was no uh padding unless you brought your own sleeping bag or blankets and which i advise you do especially if you don't have heat i i honestly don't know if i would ever be able to do 
van touring ever again it's it's rough so on you hard. like physically but like also mentally and emotionally you have to think about it from like the other aspect of it psychologically when you first start touring it's so fleeting and it goes by so fast and like it's so awesome because you're just living in the moment but you know I was very fortunate. I had a job that was really cool with me. I could take time off. They would let me go on tour and I have a job when I came back. So I was really fortunate uh, at the time I was touring. But at the same time, as time goes on, you know, you play more and more gigs and then like, I don't know, man, you kind of get a skewed view of reality. You live this lifestyle for so long and you're just like constantly on the road. It's fulfilling in some aspects and depending on the person you are, it's fulfilling. It can be fulfilling to your life or it can be fulfilling to your ego. It really depends on the person you are. Yeah, I mean, like it can be the greatest experience and it can really break a person, too. I've seen it happen. Nothing uh, damages your ego more when you haven't showered in five days. Absolutely. You just feel like absolutely disgusting. Being in public is always anxiety inducing because it's just fuck. <laughs> I smell horrible. Yeah, but also here's a, you know, pro tip. Bring like these days the equivalent of a uh, dude wipes. You know, they're they're your best friend. That's true. And take a shower in the bathroom at the venue. Yep. Got to do what you got to do. I mean, there's that. The Walmart shower was very real. Certain truck stops you can pay, like Loves, you can pay for showers. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. And hope you have flip-flops because I would not walk on yeah. one of those fucking floors. No barefoot. Hell Don't no. Don't go barefoot anywhere. No, it's absolutely not. 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 even Especially venue bathrooms. I have, <laughs> like, horror memories of seeing that hot tub down inside Toad's place. Blah. Oh, 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 ooh. Yeah. Ooh, that toast. thing hadn't been that that thing hadn't been active since probably like the late eighties, early nineties. Are they still open? Who toads? Yeah. Yeah. You know, good for them. They survived. Tuxedo Junction had a disgusting green room. Oh my god. The yes, shower in there, uh you just chose to stink. There was no way. There was no way. No way. I was taking a if I was taking a shower, I'd do it with my shoes and leave my shoes out in the Leave my shoes out in the sun the next day and let them dry off because there is no way. But flip flops were a thing back then, and they're comfy. They keep, especially in the summer, they keep you from having stinky er feet. I mean, let's look at it this way, though. By the end of a run, those are going directly in the fucking trash. True. <laughs> There's a lot of things that went in the trash at the end of a going out it's uh i'm trying to think of all the different things that we did that made life a lot easier with vans getting along is a big thing uh trying to have as much fun especially through adversity you know blowing tires uh you know axles breaking transmissions breaking yeah gas leaks uh just van flipping we'll talk about that yeah in another episode accidents uh dan and i have both been in accidents on the road uh mine is the most ironic of ironic but you know we'll we'll save that i think ours are both ironic in very similar ways yeah very much so well the only thing i can divulge from that at the moment because that's a future episode is that things were brand new <laughs> ish oh man <laughs> and like in my aspect uh man we'll i missed there. that van we'll get there I do miss the aspect of it. It's the hanging out with your boys, doing what you like to do, uh, the reactions you get at night when you're on stage. Because realistically, let's let's be honest, the whole thing is about being on stage. That's that's the that was the fun for me. Writing the music, yes, like that that's for me too. But the live performance aspect and going to a place where you actually have people you could be hundreds of miles away from home and you got somebody already wearing a t-shirt that they've purchased at a previous show. If you were there before, or you have somebody yelling your lyrics. I mean, that's, that's a big feeling. It's gotta be the only thing that I can compare to probably being like a, a like a professional sports athlete where people are wearing your jerseys. 
Yeah, it's definitely like a wild experience, and it's like, and inc- don't sugarcoat it, it's an incredible high. Having people that are like so into what you're doing and resonating with it, you know, being able to share some aspect of that with you, it's why music's so powerful and so awesome. Uh, I mean, I had a unique aspect considering, like, I don't know how many people uh, know of my band, but we were a Christian band. So the thing with us is just like, at least for me personally, at the time for anyway, you know, I tried to write stuff that was conflicting to like some of the aspects of, I don't know, the problems I saw in religion and Western religion. And we would get a lot of pushback from it, but it was great playing shows and like being able to actually have conversations with people. Cause I think that was a bigger thing for me at the time, you know, just being able to play shows and we would tour with bands that wouldn't have the same beliefs as us, but we could sit back and have a beer and just have a conversation. Even if it got heated, I think the biggest thing I miss is just having that sense of community and just, you know, running into your buddies on the road and just like always coming across people. If we were in different states and cross paths or, you know, that shit happened all the time. I remember yeah. we were traveling to Florida and we randomly ran into the last 10 seconds of life and we were like, oh, hey, we were at the same po- fucking Walmart. <laughs> same tour or no different tour? No. No, wow. Different. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's I think uh, the thing was, it's like we were coming from different ends. They were on like a different run. We were going to the same show, but we just ended up at the same parking lot and it wasn't planned at all. Oh, uh, so was, there there was certain dates that they were on. Yeah, we were playing we were playing a, a show in Virginia Beach and we just happened to stop at this parking lot and then we saw another van and so we pulled up next to him and we we're like, Oh fuck, what's up guys? <laughs> Small world. And with us, like we've played shows, that's how we met. We met playing shows and you know, the band that I was in at the time, <laughs> we had a merchandise with inverted crosses and like gutted pigs and stuff. We were... And we all were cool with each other, though. Yeah. Like, that's kind of what was cool about that scene. Then you ha- it was kind of that. I don't know. I know it's more seen in like the punk and hardcore scene more than anything. And I mean, obviously, like that's what Connecticut's really known for is its hardcore scene. You know, just that sense of just like, hey, everybody has different ways of looking at things and it doesn't make them a shitty person. We can all come together and play music and have differing views on life. And I think, I don't know, uh, I want to get out to more shows and see what it's like these days, especially if I can find like a decent local scene somewhere. But I want to see if that mentality is even still alive, because it would be nice if there's new forerunners to keep that stuff going because the world fucking needs it. And and another thing with with being in that scene too, is that a lot of the bands that were playing with each other, especially through 2008, nine and 10 and 11 were all kind of at the same level. And we all selfishly were trying to get to another level. And if that meant us playing and supporting each other, no matter the views, like with my band, just because we had inverted crosses and gutted pigs and, you know, beneath the gallows had Jesus on a cross. We all yep. played, we all played with each other, but it wasn't about the views. Cause I'm not a Satanist. So it wasn't anything that I was believed in. It was, it was, I guess a gimmick. It was an image. It was, it was the, the way the band was perceived. And there, there probably are Christian metal bands or Christian bands that are out there that not everybody in the band is, you know, a church going person. So they, it, it could be partially, uh, not a facade, but that's the image, the brand of the band and the way that the band played out. So that was a that was a really special thing. I'm sure other scenes are very similar. Uh, there wouldn't be as many bands if, if they weren't the same, where everybody got along in a certain aspect. I don't know. I think these days with all the new technologies, the new avenues, like the the scene is just completely different in the way the whole industry as a whole works is completely different. But, you know, I see aside from like, you know, you can see the the animosity and some online interactions. Sure, because that's just how the Internet works these days, unfortunately. But aside from that, if you actually like go see these bands or if you see their actual like communities and stuff like that, it's just a a lot more. I don't know. It seems like a much more welcoming in place than it used to be. But at the same time, there's still 
conflicts within i think the biggest thing is seeing conflicts within fandoms of bands which i think is just like really it, it it's overblown more than it's ever been mm. oh that's that's what happens when you don't we're talking from a different perspective too you know we're talking from yeah i can only talk from my experience yeah yes we're the viewer when we go to shows but our perspective at least for me, my perspective at the show is I'm staring at the soundboard. I'm staring at the light guy. I'm like, dude, look at all this new technology. Like what's this guy doing? I'm looking at the production of the, of the whole thing. And yeah. I'm just yearning and yearning and yearning to be on the other side of that press barricade or be on the side of the stage. Not that I don't like being in the crowd because if I was at a show, most of the time I'd want to be by the soundboard because that's where the sound guy is. It's, that's where you're going to hear generally the best sound because, you know, even though he's got a set of cans on his head, uh, it's still that's center crowd. That's, you know, center stage, center crowd. So you're, you're dealing with sonically. Everything is coming right there. That is yeah. your, like, that is your point of reference for the entire venue. And that brings you to like the venue itself. You spend so much time in these clubs with an empty floor. And the only thing that's on the floor is just gear and dudes and people, you know, just walking yeah. around. You're always got a pop going on of a snare, especially if it's midday and you're getting things done. If load ins are early. And that's the only thing I could say is when those things are happening, yes, it's fun and surreal to be a part of that type of foggy environment of just stuff moving all the time and going on around you. It's it, go, go, go. Yeah. It's, it's, it's business at that point. My advice for we just got a van or we're, we're we got a minivan and we're, packing it in we're all gonna sleep in here uh during the day some of those days especially if you if, if you're on a longer run especially those days sleep sleep lay in the van while it's nice and warm and pass the fuck out because you know unless you have band members like mine where they won't let you sleep but <laughs> you know. yeah yeah i i've been there or you have somebody that snores extremely loud in your band that's I always actually never dealt with that never dealt oh, with the snoring gosh. it's i'm the not giggling. naming names but oh man the there was giggles. a member in my band that was absolutely notorious get to a venue at like 3 30 in the morning and everybody's like all right it's time for bed we'll we'll see in the morning and you got like till Till five thirty, you got two of the guys that are like <laughs> in the back, like just <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, no privacy, yeah, absolutely none, and that's another thing that you kind of have to like accept going into this. There is zero privacy, and the best thing I could say in retrospect, plan activities when you can. Like yeah, to where if, you're in a city. You, if you have a day off, if you can plan to go to like a park or something to where you can go and do something, if you're going to be together, aside from playing the show and being in the van, it can get monotonous. So like you need to break it up and do actual things that will help bond and bring guys together and also give you a chance to have some private time. If you're going to be in close quarters like that with people anyways, and you've agreed to it, you already in this day and age just from like all the experiences from shows and tours past i can't recommend doing stuff like that enough because we didn't do enough of it yeah i agree yeah we didn't uh spend a lot of time at the venue spent a lot of time at the van uh we went you know to find places to eat and you know looked around the immediate venue area but never we didn't at least from my knowledge we didn't have like uber or lyft so we weren't able to you know hop in a taxi. that wasn't a thing you know, yeah, hop in a car and, and I mean, there were taxis, but they're outlandish in certain areas. You know, but, you're lucky if you're staying with somebody and they're like, oh, do you want to go here? Yes, please. Yep. But yeah, yeah. Oh, and rule number one, we've learned the hard way. Well, I've learned the hard way. Make sure you have, if everybody's trustworthy, which they should be, if you're going to be sleeping two inches away from five other dudes. Uh, especially like your merch guy. We've had some unhonest un merch people. We've had some unhonest. Oh, man. Uh, we've had some dishonest merch people. We've had some dishonest uh, road people, I guess you could say. Um, make sure that the people that you're on the road with are responsible enough to hold on to a fucking key for your van and your trailer. Uh, if you have multiple people, even better. But my suggestion never have one copy of a van and trailer key because that could be 
catastrophic if you're in like Las Cruces, New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could I could see that. Thankfully, we didn't have any bad experiences ever with like crew on our side anyway. We had this awesome merch guy, Ryan Turley. Shout out Ryan. What's going on, dude? Um but yeah, no, nah, he he was awesome. Uh he was just this really awesome uh uh dude we met from playing Launch Festival actually. Uh another band that was on the same label we were on called Ace Augustine uh back in the day. Hmm. Um they were friends with him, that's how we became acquaintances and yeah, no, that, that was a really good time. He was our merch guy for our first few tours. It was a really, really awesome to take him along. Well, I'm not going to name any names, but if that person hears this, they knew who the fuck they are. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> sorry, bro. Uh, I'm not really sorry, but you know, it, it is what it is. Fuck uh, you. <laughs> so, I guess I want to. This has been this has been a lot of fun talking about it. We can we can go on and on and on about yeah for sure different things. Uh, I guess you could say like key, you know, you can give, give different pointers, keys, uh, fucking deodorant. That might be a, a big thing. Uh, you know, wet wipes, like, like Dan said, but food, I want to end this out on what's the best thing that you've ever had on the road. Like that surprised the hell out of you. You went in there and you were like, Oh my God, it might not have been, it might've been just because you were uh, hungry. No, but... I actually have uh, a great story about this. So, um, we were on a label called face down records. Now um, they had a lot of cool bands on their roster over the years. They yes, had, they, they, put, yes, they put out like the first comeback kid record. Uh, they did, uh, they had four today impending doom, sleeping giant war of ages, like all sorts of awesome bands. Uh, Good label. Th- those who fear they, they, they had a lot of really cool music over the years. Um, and we were really fortunate enough to be a part of that. And uh, the f- we were on one of their promotion labels, kind of like what a lot of labels, uh, I guess, still have, like Rise had Velocity, and uh, there were all sorts of stuff like that. So we were initially signed when we did our EP, uh, to Strike First Records. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we got to play Face Down Fest, and this is a yearly festival that they used to do. Uh, they don't do it as often anymore because the lineup has wavered, and they're just a smaller operation, but... Back in the day, they would do Face Down Fest. It would be like two or three days long. You'd all crash at this place called The Stronghold. Uh, that was like this uh, church or whatever that had a bunch of rooms and stuff you could crash at. But uh, the main gig, at least that year, the main stage was at the Glass House in Pomona. I'm going there. So awesome venue. Yeah. Uh, but the year we played, one of, they have like the best catering so like the first day after everybody gets there the first day after uh they treated us to it was my first time having west coast actual food it was my first uh this was my first trip out there and uh they just had a local caterer come and do tacos and like oh my god they had uh carne asada they had chicken and then they had uh they had a, a a wild card. They had beef tongue, and I tried it for the first time, and it was delicious. Beef tongue is delicious. It's so good. It's so good, dude. But that's not even the end of it. So then the second day, uh, so the first day was like the uh, main stage or what, or the first stage. So it was at the church. But then the next day uh, was at uh, the glass house, and they just did. <laughs> they just got bought a giant amount of el pollo loco (laughs) for everybody it was great and then uh the last day uh what they do is uh we all go to the beach and we would go to this pizza place and they would treat us to just this amazing amazing pizza i wish i could remember the name of the place but it was some of the best pizza i've had especially on the west coast and outside of new england that's a big compliment it is yeah, but that, that that was probably like my favorite food experiences. And like we did that twice and we got to play two face down fests. And I'm like super thankful we got to experience that. It was really awesome. Tacos and pizza. You can't go wrong, right? Seriously. I would say I'm not a big cheesesteak fan, but I had mentioned it earlier. Uh, Pat's King of Steaks was probably one of the better places. You know, it was good food. You know, it wasn't premier food, but there was a place it was actually quite local to the area. We were somewhere in Massachusetts, and it was this run-of-the-mill 
Chinese restaurant because we were like, all right, we're not going here. There wasn't much in this town, but they had a venue, but the venue kitchen wasn't open at the time because we were there, you know, around lunch. And I was like, you know what? I really want this Chinese place. It was in like a strip mall. And I was like, this is going to be terrible. And I should have known better being from New England and, it's usually the terrible looking place. It's kind of like with Mexican food in Southern California. It's usually the dive that has the better food. Absolutely. And we went in there and everybody ordered something different. I think I might have ordered like steamed dumplings. I think I ordered some soup. And then I ordered, uh, you know, for people who know like New York style Chinese food, you get, you know, like general sour beef and broccoli with rice or lo mein plus an egg roll plus a can of soda. And it used to be like nine bucks. I don't know what it is now. Um, yeah, it's probably close to 12, 13 bucks. Yeah, it's still it's worth it. You get a lot of food. Um, it's a, it, it is a lot of food still. And I ordered all this food and I was like, I'm just if I don't eat it, I'll give it, you know, somebody else will eat it. Definitely. And I ate all of it. <laughs> and I was cramping before we went on because I had so much like fried food. And it was just so, so delicious. But that's that's what I could say for, for being on the road. Definitely Pat's King of Steaks. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I forget the name of your Chinese restaurant, but it was delicious. But I will say, if you're going to eat pizza, if you are on tour and you're in Southern California, I can recommend a few pizza places. If you're from New England and you're a pizza snob, Bronx Pizza in San Diego, California, you close your eyes, you're home. That's all I can tell you. Hell yeah. Delicious stuff. Delicious stuff. And uh, as Dave Portnoy says, good undercarriage. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's delicious stuff. But yeah, we will definitely revisit van life. I'm sure we can think of some other other things. And I will probably catch up on it a little bit when we talk about, you know, crashing the shit out of our vehicles <laughs> uh, yeah that's yeah we can continue that conversation because that'll lead into other things <laughs> yeah. yeah but now i'm hungry so yeah for sure i gotta awesome. go food shopping so awesome Thank you all for listening. We are definitely going to talk more about road and van living for sure. But for now, we'll see you on the next one. 